Let's go to John 21. We're in a series called Dying Grace. Uh, and uh, this is our third lesson in this series. Uh, I was coming back from, I, I mentioned this before, but I was coming back from Rome, Georgia. I had a funeral over there to do, and I was coming back from, and it was time for me to start a new study and just coming back and talking and, and, and that I thought, you know, I think I'll, I'll do a study. It just funerals remind me of how, how necessary it is for people to be prepared because you never know, do you? And maybe it's not you, but maybe it's somebody very close to you. And um, so, anyhow, that's how this came about. If you wonder, how do you come up with these ideas? <laughs> I got it from going to a funeral. <laughs> um, I'm in John 21. We're looking at 14 verses here. And this might like seem like a strange thing, to, to a passage to preach on bereavement. How, how adjusting to the loss of somebody close to you um, could be a time of making bad decisions and not staying focused. And so I want to talk about this. And, and um, after these things, that is, Jesus Christ has died. He has been buried. And three days later, he rose on Resurrection Sunday. And he has been, for the next 40 days, he will be, in, he will be doing uh, post-resurrection appearances with his disciples and teaching them before he goes back to the Father. And this is one of those occasions. So when it says, after these things, the things that he's talking about after these things is after Christ has been raised from the dead and is going around doing ministry, in a resurrection body. Are you with me? Uh, there was like some 11 recorded post-resurrection appearances of Christ after he was raised from the dead. 40 days before he went back to the Father, 10 days before Pentecost, which opens the book of Acts. Well, so after these things, uh, Jesus manifested himself again to his disciples. He's made another po what we call post-resurrection appearance at the Sea of Tiberias, uh, and, and, or some would call that Galilee, and he manifested himself in this way. Now, when it says manifested, he's in a resurrection body, agreed? You know, he's been raised from the dead. Okay. He's in a, and, and in this body he's appearing with, that's why it's called manifesting. I mean, we don't say that when somebody comes to visit us. Well, he manifested himself to us, right? We could probably go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> send, hit, send that guy to jail well anyhow uh, they were gathered together now watch this group this is a few of the disciples we've got Simon Peter we've got Thomas called Didymus uh, Nathaniel we've got the sons of Zebedee James John and two others of his disciples unnamed uh, that's seven now, we only have 11 left, right? Right? Because Judas has hung himself. Simon Peter said to them, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Do you know what he did before he became a minister of Christ? He was a professional fisherman. I don't know how a person becomes a professional fisherman unless maybe it's he catches two or three fish. Does that make him professional? I don't know. More than you can feed your family, maybe. That's what made us a farmer. Well, any. I see. They said to him, thank you. I appreciate that. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out, they got in the boat, and that night they did what? You know, it's famous, isn't it? They fished all night and caught nothing. Yeah? You've probably sung that in him, that hymn in church. They fished all night and caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. 
Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, they're about a hundred yards, you're going to see, they're about a hundred yards from the beach when he hollers to them. Children, it's that's technon. Children, you do not have, you do not have any fish on you or, or do you? They answered no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find a catch. Now there's your fisherman. <laughs> I mean, when he can see where the fish are 100 yards on, from the beach to the, where the boat is, that's GPS in a, in a, a big time way, isn't it? Now, if I'd have fished all night and I had a stranger on the beach 100 yards out telling me to cast my net <laughs> on the right side, I'd have said he's a Republican. <laughs> and and I, probably wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't have thrown my net over, right? You know how they, they talk about right and left in politics today. They ca they ca but they cast, therefore, what do we got to lose business? They, they cast, therefore... And then they were not, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Now, there's very few times, except when Jesus fish or gets involved in fish, do you know numbers, right? But it seems like every time he he goes to the fish market, he always tells you how much number of fish he gets, right? You know, the feeding of the five thousand business. That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, that would be John, said to Peter, is it the Lord? I mean, no stranger could do this. This got to be the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he took off his garments, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. That guy don't take much for him to jump out of a boat, does it? <laughs> I mean, for a fisherman, you think the last guy that would leave would be the captain, right? I mean, where's the captain? He's the captain of this boat. He's supposed to, he's supposed to go down with it. He goes like, y'all on your own. But the other disciples came in a little boat, for they were not far from land, about 100 yards away, dragging their net full of fish. So when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid with fish on it and bread. I'll tell you one thing. If Jesus invites you out to dinner, he always, he always, he always pays it, doesn't he? Doesn't he? I mean, he had all grace all the way. Jesus said to them, uh, bring me some of the fish you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and threw the net to, drew the net to the land full of large fish. Look at this. 153. <laughs> I mean, who's counting? 153. Fished all night and caught nothing until Jesus showed up. You had, you, you had that kind of a life? Boy, that was my life. Fished all night and caught nothing until Jesus came into my life. What a glorious day that was. What a glorious day that was. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him. Who are you knowing that it must be the Lord? Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. If nothing else, that should have rung a bell, shouldn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> this is now the third. Watch this now. Verse 14. Now, this is now the third time that Jesus was manifested post-resurrection appearance to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, What's important in this story is how you deal with bereavement. You know what they did? They went back to their old life. They went back to their old life. What were they before? They, they, all these guys, these seven, they were fishermen. They just went back to the old way. They went back to the old way. That's not why. That's not why Christ saves you. 
That's not why God called you into ministry. That's not why he said, I'll make you fishers of men. So you could go back fishing for fish. So the message here tonight for somebody, maybe the internet, after a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> classroom etiquette. Classroom etiquette says you have to be, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people born again, indwelt by the Holy Spirit for spiritual living. Spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. There it is. If you think you're going to get through this life without knowing what the Bible says to help you make your decisions, to help you through the day, help you through the night, well, you, you, you've missed part of the big part of why you're being saved. So, a classroom etiquette would say, <clears throat> you can't study the Bible carnal. How would I know if I'm carnal? Personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins in your life. It could be overt sins. It could be sins of the tongue. That's three categories you could look at. And if you're aware of it in your conscience or conviction of the Holy Spirit, 1 John 1, 9 says this, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Why is that important? Put you back in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit entered your life at the point of salvation and he is not permitted to leave. He's with you all the way. You know, you know the Bible says that God will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you know another thing? The moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit took up residence inside your body and your body became the temple of God and he's not permitted to leave you. <coughs> and why is he there? Well, he's to teach, for one thing, in Bible studies, teach you the word of God. So 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, so every head bowed and every eye closed give you an opportunity to do that in your own priesthood. 1 Peter 2 says every believer is a priest in the church age. It give you an opportunity to confess sin if necessary in privacy in your personal life. This is true for those who are studying with us on the internet. Just because you're home or someplace else doesn't give you another way to deal with this. You do the same thing in classroom etiquette. You're still in classroom with me. And so, our Father, we thank you today for these who have come our way, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God to our lives on the subject of bereavement. There are phases of adjusting to life through bereavement. We hope to touch on that through this story of John 21 and the disciples who are going through the adjustment period of bereavement. And so we pray we would learn from them in Jesus' name. Amen. The lesson tonight is for believers who understand the doctrinal information given on lesson one and two. This is my third lesson. You really need to know lesson one and two. You can go to our internet doctrinal studies and pick them up if you want to, because this lesson is not, is not geared towards you dying. It's geared towards someone in your life that's very dear to you dying, and you've got to deal with it. I'm talking tonight to those who are in bereavement, who have been through bereavement, or may be going through bereavement, because we don't get out of here without it. You're not going to leave this life without that. You know, unless the rapture comes. <laughs> Otherwise, we all go the same way, box. We go in a box. So... Uh, that, that's important. The lesson is directed to those uh, who already understand that to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse six, seven, and eight. What's interesting about the, those verses that people miss, verse six talks about uh, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Verse eight talks about the same thing. At the point of death, you leave your body and you go to be with the Lord. Boom, there you are. I mean, you talk about space travel. Well, that's about as good as it gets uh, because that's the third heaven. He's in the third heaven. Uh, even when you're in outer space, you aren't even near it. And yet when you're on earth, you're as, you're as close as a prayer to it, aren't you? I Man, that's a pretty amazing idea. Well, in verse 6, it talks about asking for a body present with the Lord. 
in verse 8, it talks about same experience. He's talking about dying, the believer's confidence as he faces death. He's just going to step out of here right into the presence of the Lord. Isn't that comforting to know that? That's dying grace. See, that's, that's something you get from being saved that you don't use till you die. I mean, that's, that's a wonderful chip, ain't it, to have. I mean, that baby sits there ready for you because of your salvation experience. If you're born again, you get this. I mean, that's, it's, it's there for you. And so to be absent from the body, but in between the experience of, of being absent from the body, and you really have to pay attention to six and eight, how he flipped it, okay? This is for your own study. But you know what's stuck in the middle of them? This wonderful message, walk by faith, not by. That's stuck in between these two messages on death. Now, you think about that. So how, is it, how important it is for you to, even though you have this chip that says, if you die, you're going to be standing present with the Lord. I don't care what. If you're saved, you're going to go to heaven when you die. You're going to heaven when you die. If you're saved, you know why? Because you didn't save yourself. You didn't die on no cross. You know what I mean? In the true sense of that. You died with him on the cross, Galatians 2.20. But you didn't die there for everybody else. I mean, he died there for you, took your place. And so Paul says, you know, I was crucified with Christ, nevertheless. Right. So this is kind of important for us. And so tonight we're talking about walking. And listen, why this important is for those who are left. Why is this verse 7 so important to us? Because that verse is for all those of, it's not for the person that dies, it's for the people that are left, who must walk by faith and not by sight. Agreed? Yes. See how important that is? It always used to bother me when I was a young Christian, I would read that, that verse, and I would go, that, that's odd. We're talking about death in verse 6, we're talking about death in verse 7, but we're talking about life in verse I mean, verse 8, but we're talking about life in verse 7. I mean, that just seems strange to me. Until I realized one day, well, look, he's talking to the bereaved. And this is a good example. The disciples are to be walking by faith. Nothing in your life should have changed as far as your relationship and whatever God has designed. Whatever his directed will for your life has not changed because somebody you love has died. Agreed? Even though the experience of that can be traumatic and all those things, as far as your relationship with God, not with the deceased, but between your relationship and God is why you're still here. That's all operational. That, all of that is still intact. And sometimes you can get so lost in the loss of a loss, you can get so lost in the loss of someone that you can lose your way. The disciples did that. They did that very thing. I've seen that happen more often than I could begin to tell you as a pastor over 40-some years in this church. Well, so that, that 2 Corinthians, on your paper, but 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, is a very interesting passage and well worth your time to look at. In our lesson text, the disciples of Jesus are still in denial about the death of Christ, and this is the third appearance of his resurrection. That's amazing to me until you live this kind of a life yourself. I mean, there are things in our life as Christians. We know we're born again. We know Jesus is our Lord. We know if I die, I go to be with him. And yet there are still things in our life that bring us into denial of the things that God wants out of our life and us to walk a different path. Would you, do, would you understand that? Uh, that's not, no, you can play, you play good poker with me, but that's all right. Now, I want to show, I took the book of Matthew. Now, we're not going to look at it, but for home study, I took the book of Matthew, notice on your paper. In chapter 16 of Matthew, they begin to openly be defiant of Jesus' teaching on his death, burial, and resurrection. All right? They become open to file. In fact, in Matthew 16 is that passage when Peter, Peter got so deep in denial with Jesus that Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You remember that? Well, that's where this whole thing started, and it only gets worse. Once you get in denial of the truth of the word of God, your life is going to get in a, whether you go to church, listen, they kept going to church and studying the Bible, 
But this is going to, listen, that denial is going to catch up with you. You float that boat down that, that, that denial, your, your life's going to be in a mess. And, and so from Matthew 16 to Matthew 17 to Matthew 20 to Matthew 26, they're in denial. And, and it would be well worth your time as, as a student of the Word of God yourself to look at those passages and see that they just kept stayed in denial. Now, we've met people like that. Maybe sometimes when we looked in the mirror and saw that guy. Right? <laughs> right? All right. I just wondered if you had the same mirror I had. In Matthew 26, 31 and 32, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away from me because of, you will all fall away from me because of me, I'll fall away of me because I don't know. I must have wrote this wrong. I can't even read it. Uh, this very night. You all fall away from me this very night. For it is written, and he, he quotes, he quote, quotes Zechari um, uh, Zechariah 13.7. Uh, and here's what it says. It says, and he's telling his disciples this. He says, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And they're the sheep. He's the shepherd, and they're the sheep. But after I have been raised, now he told this before he died, right? He, he said, and after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. They never, they didn't believe that. They didn't believe that. They didn't believe. Listen, and they're still in denial after he showed himself three times. Da 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 da. Think about that. Think how sometimes how difficult it is to bring yourself back into your appropriate relationship with the Lord when somebody you've been involved with for many, many years in a loving, nurturing, caring way, and that person's died. We've had that mother. We've had that brother. We've had that son. We, we've had this experience in our life. If I mean, you don't even have to have, be old of it to do that. I mean, I was given my father's flag, you know, at three, four, five years old. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> you know, de 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 dead in the Second World War. I mean, I mean, you don't have to be an old person to have that experience. You can be a young person to have that. Well, I want to talk about four things tonight on bereavement. The disciples of Jesus were unwilling and I showed you in Matthew, were unwilling to face the reality of his death. See, that's the hardest part. And, and listen, sometimes, listen, he's appeared to him three times in a resurrection form, and they're still having difficulty with, they're still focused on the loss. Is that not hard to get? I mean, they're still struggling with it. Is that him on the beach? I don't know. Let's go. Is that, could that really be him? I don't know. I, yeah. They're still struggling with it. And, and the biggest thing is, what are we going to do now? You know what they did? They went back to the old life. They didn't stay focused on, listen. Somewhere I got, I'm going to jump ahead to Matthew. I want you to go to Matthew with me. Go to Matthew 4. This is in another point, but, you know, I just write it down. The Lord decides how I'm going to do it. By, all, by now, we all know that. Matthew 4, 18. This is when Jesus is calling his disciples first. You remember Matthew 4, he's calling, he's been baptized. He's gone to the wilderness in Matthew 3, 40 days of, you know, fighting the devil and all that. business. Remember that? And now he's back, and he starts his ministry, and he's calling his disciples. Walking by the Sea of Galilee, that's where he is today with them, by the way. In our study, John 24, third post-resurrection period, he's back there with them. They're back, on the, they're back where they started. See, that's my point. They went back to where they, they went back to their former life before they met Christ and before he called them into ministry. 
Be careful now. And walking by the Sea of Galilee, he said to his two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And so, over the course of the next three years, he has made them fishers of men. He has sent them out to the world, the twos, uh, to convert, right? He's, they've been on mission trips. They, they, for three years, have been trained how to be fishers of men. I, I, listen to me now, not somebody else. I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men. And listen, did that, listen, do you think that changed because Jesus died on a cross buried? No, it made it more important, did it not? And post-resurrection appearances, he said, look, I've still got to go, but I'm leaving. Listen, I'm leaving my ministry with you. I'm leaving it with you, right? There's still, nothing has changed in the divine scheme of the plan of God in regard to the calling they have on their life. Are you with me? Oh, you better listen tonight. Lord's got somebody. Lord's got a hold of somebody on this. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately. Listen, without, th this amazes me. Immediately, they left their nets. They left their business and followed him. Right? And for three years, he trained them how to be fishers of men. Nothing's changed about that calling. He began to tell them, I'm leaving, but I'm leaving the ministry in good hands. I'm leaving it in your hands. I've trained you to be fishers of men. Right? They think that all of that is with him, not with them. No matter how many times they ate fish, they never... They're, I just went back to catching them. And why would they do that? Well, in this case, it's bereavement. You know what they're not doing? Between in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 and 8 talks about dying, right? 7 talks about living. It tells you how you're supposed to live when you're dealing with death. Are you with me? Oh, please, listen. If this hasn't knocked on your door, it's coming. This is, this is a normal thing of life, isn't it? I mean, what neighborhood doesn't have a funeral home? It's got to have more than, you know, if it's got a post office, it's got a funeral home. That's how big it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't take much. Right? Being an old country pastor, I know this. No. Oh. Listen, they're unwilling to face the reality of death. How do you face it? You continue that this person is in good hands. The person who's died is okay. It's the person that's living, the folks is on. And what, what, how, how, were, how do they deal with bereavement? They walk by faith and not by what? You know what the disciples are doing? They're walking by sight. They went back. They went back to the old. They, they, they listen. They sh they should have shifted in it. Well, listen. We still are fishermen. We just don't have the top the top fishermen. I don't know what you'd call the head of. You know, if you got sheep, you got a shepherd. I don't. The captain, I guess. The captain's gone, but you know, the rest of us know how to do this. They refuse to listen to learn, in order to to live God's word. Listen to 2 Timothy 3, 7. All, listen, always learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth. Wouldn't, isn't that a sad thing? That was the disciples, always learning. Now, some things that didn't conflict in their life, they got it. They went to church. Uh, yeah, I can apply that because it's no big deal. But let me tell you, when the word of God becomes difficult in your life, when it becomes a big deal of what you've got to surrender to him in order to walk that walk. See, you walk by what? Not sight. And 
when it becomes sight to you and not faith, you got a problem, haven't you? I mean, why would you, why would you ever give up faith for sight? Well, whatever, whatever you have done in your past seemed to be good enough reason for you. But it's not. It's not, it's not because it never has a good ending. So, always learning, never able to come to knowledge of the truth. You ought to read verse 14, too, on your own. It is well worth your read. When I put these verses down, I don't know. Look, I, I, I tell you all the time, if you throw this paper away, not on my property here, okay? You take that home. You throw it away at home, all right? Because all these verses here are really important to your life. They're important. Now, I, I don't have enough time to read everything. I mean, I only got an hour. Everybody gets nervous and they get fidgety and they want to go home. I understand that. So I write a lot of this stuff down that says, take this home and read it. Okay, all right. They fail to inhale and exhale the word of God. The, the, inhale, exhale the word of God. In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is God breathed. Remember that? Well, breathing is inhale, exhale, isn't it? Okay. You got to take it in. You got to give it out. That, that's, that's cycling by faith. That's walking by faith. And how important is this in a crisis? Here's another passage that's really important in your life. Colossians 2, 6, and 7. Boy, you need to read that. Colossians, it talks about, the, it talks about, it talks about how faith d is developed in your life to give you the strength to walk through the most difficult. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You see, this is a bereavement. Yea, though I walk through the shadow, right? The valley of the shadow. Uh, what are you doing? Crawling, crying? Oh, but I don't know. It depends on what walking is. Walking through. That's what's important. <clears throat> Therefore, because they're not cycling the Bible, they're going to Bible study, they're hearing it in one ear and out the other, not taking it serious, right? Oh, I don't think so. I don't know what he's, why is he trying to impress us talking about dying, going to Jerusalem and dying? That's so depressing. We know that's not true. Why does he do that? They're never buying into it until it, it happens. And now it happens, they're unprepared, right? They're not prepared. They were not prepared for his death. They, they, are, they were not prepared for his death. That's the book of Matthew. I gave you every bit of it there in scripture. They weren't prepared. They were not prepared. Listen, it's tough enough when you are prepared by the word of God. If you've lost a loved one, you know what I'm saying. Now they are struggling through bereavement trying to recover to some normality of their Christian life. Unfortunately, they go by sight, not by faith. They left their calling and went back to their career. Listen, when God gives you a calling, it is your career. People all the time say to me, they said it when I was 10 years as a pastor of this church, uh, uh, when you're going. They didn't say it that way, but that's what they insinuated. When you're going. Well, when I got 20 years here, they, they said the same, when you going? 30 years, when you going? Now I'm at 44 years, I still hear it, when you going? They say it different ways. When I say here's a vision that we have for the next 20 years or whatever, they don't write it down. They think that's a bunch of bull. Listen, I may not be here, but the vision still will be. <laughs> Jeez. Jesus is not going to be with them, but his calling upon their life is, is it not? The calling is still. Whether Christ is here or there, the calling is always there. They go back, they walk them by sight. They go back to the old man normality. They're looking for normal. They're looking for normality. Do you understand? They're looking for normal. They were already in normal. Normal, you didn't, normal didn't leave you. You left normal. Normal is that you're fishers of men. Is that not normal? They went back to the old way. They went to the abnormal. 
be careful. The decisions you make during a time of bereavement are very important to your walk with the Lord. Your walk with the Lord. Here's the second thing. They are unable to adjust to life after the death of Christ, this loved one of theirs, even after, listen, even after three post-resurrection appearances. You would think after somebody showed up after a funeral, right, would be a pretty good deal. But three times, let's go out and have breakfast. Let's go have lunch. And he probably, whatever he fed you was what your problem was. He fed you ham because, you know, you were a ham. He fed you, you know, I don't know. <coughs> it is important to remember this is now the third time Jesus has manifested to him disciples after he's been raised from the dead, and they still not buying in. So they're not even walking by sight well, are they? Come on now. The word manifest means they can see it. They're not walking by faith. No, I'm going to walk by sight. And how is that going? You're blind as a bat. So much for walking by sight when you should be walking by faith. When you think you're walking by sight, you're blind as a bat. I don't know how that. That's a saying, right? You grew up with a saying like blind as a bat. I don't know. What did they go back doing? They're, they're in bereavement. What did they go back doing? Went back to the old life. Went back to career not calling. And listen, are, listen, Johnny, are they having any success? They were, they were successful businessmen, and they left their business, and they followed Jesus. How are you doing? How are they doing, Johnny? They Fished all night and caught zero. Fished all night. Listen, they could have fished all week. And Jesus shows up, 100 yards out, says, cast your net over onto the right side. They caught so many fish, they couldn't, they couldn't bring them to shore. What's that say to them? Well, it's a good thing Jesus is wrong. We had a good day of fishing. No. Be fishers of men. Was this the biggest catch you've ever gotten in your life, Peter? Yeah, I never caught 153 fish all day. I never caught 153. And they, I love this. The Bible said they caught 153 fish that were large, not one little one in the group. <laughs> now, what are the odds of throwing in that over and not picking up trash and an old tire? You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, and picking up things you said, oh, God, I didn't know they were under the boat. And all that comes in right when you, you cast a net. They weren't fishing. You know, they're they doing the net deal. And when they did, they had 153 primo fish. How, how, how big were they? You know that old saying? You know how people stick it out, arms out, the biggest fish I ever caught. 153 all eatable, sellable fish and large. I love that. The Bible says, and large. <laughs> and God good. Why would you, why, why would you not think that, that Christ in his resurrection has got the most power? He's still the most powerful person in your life, is he not? Died on a cross. Three days later, up from the grave, he's still the most powerful person in your life. We know that probably better than the disciples today, maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. And, and John 21 helps us understand why they went back to fishing. Point three, there is always a before, during, and after the death of a loved one. Always. There's always a before. There's always a during. And there's always an after. And listen, you have to work your way through that. I mean, sometimes it's the before long drawn out illness or whatever it is it's very difficult to get back i mean you got bills you got this you got that i mean there i mean the sometimes that carries more weight of trying to recover from than the death itself and so i say to you there's always a, a before a during and an after the death of a loved one 
and how you adjust doctrinally by walking by faith and not by sight is a big issue. I'm telling you, I pastored a long time, and I'm telling you, that is a big issue. How you feel, <clears throat> now listen to me, this, this is important. How you feel is not as important as what you think. Because the issue is to walk by faith and not by sight. And they're bo both based on how we're viewing. Right? Wh where does faith come from? Listen, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I mean, you're not going to have faith without it. Not the faith that can carry you. Though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. That, that's the faith you want. Would you agree with that? So wh That's what I want. I, I, that's what I want. There's where the witness to other people comes in. When you see people go through just, and just strong in their faith with God, people go like, I tell you, whatever they got, I want. Funeral is a, a great time to, to make a statement to people that think they know you and don't know you because they've never met the faith in you. And they meet the faith there because it's raw. Hmm? It's raw. How you feel is part of the human experience. I'm not belittling it. I'm just saying it needs to be put in a different place. How you feel is part of the human experience, but how you think is part of your spiritual experience. How you, how you think. When you catch yourself going off by sight, that's not where you want to go because there's, you want to be in the faith. You want to walk by faith, not by, not by sight. The lesson given to you uh, before, during, and after a personal crisis. Now, listen to me. Listen to me now. The lessons, plural, the lessons given to you before, during, and after a personal crisis like death have a much larger divine agenda attached than what is happening in real time. Now, it's going to take you a while to think about that. But if you've been through this, you know what I'm telling you. The lessons that, that God was teaching you before, what he's teaching you during, and what he's going to teach you after a personal crisis in your life, like a death of a loved one, are attached to a larger agenda than what you're facing in real time. And this walk is really important for God. This walk right now that he's asking of you is really important. And really, that's my point, but a, a great point in my lesson. Do you know what these disciples in our lesson did for a living before they were called to be disciples? Well, they, they were called to be, listen, they had a calling. They had a career before Jesus came into their life. After Jesus came into their life, they got a calling, didn't they? What did they do? They left their careers. Nothing has changed because Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead. In fact, everything has now come to a head, come to a focal point, hasn't it? A very positive thing. They don't see it. They don't see it because they're not walking by faith. They went back to a career. The calling didn't die. The calling didn't die. It is interesting that in the book of John, it opens and closes with Jesus' association with fishermen. A good buddy of mine uh, brought that to my attention one day because Fishers of Men was his good one. Uh, you've heard us talk about Chuck Farmer. Chuck Farmer told me one day, we we're out fishing. Well, he, he was fishing. I was in the boat. I, hold, I held a rod, but that's all I did. Um, and he would, and then he, he'd get me in a boat, and then he'd teach me. And he said, you know, John, Ron, the fish of men is really a big issue. It was for him because he liked both, and uh, fishing, fishing. And, and he told me, John, you know John opened, so I had, when I got home, I, I checked him out. And I, I thought that was interesting. So every time I, 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 I'm in this book, I think about, Mr. Farmer, yeah, fished all night and caught nothing. Throw it on the right side. A guy on shore 100 yards from you, throw it on the right side. <laughs> I'll throw you on the right side. 
fished all night and caught nothing. <laughs> Throw it on the right side. Listen, I've thrown that net every side there is of this boat. <laughs> but they did it. Did you notice that fishing in that story? You probably didn't pay that much attention. But fishing in that story dominates the subject. Right? It dominates. What are you doing? I'm fishing. How come you're not preaching? How come you're not preaching? What are you doing out here in this boat? You going on a mission trip? Let me see your net. Ah, oh, where's your Bible? Oh, you got a net and no Bible. Hmm. Guess you guess you're not fishing for men anymore. I don't know. What lesson did Jesus teach them about their spiritual calling? I'll tell you one they missed. <laughs> Philippians 121. You know what it says? For me to live. For me to live. See, that's what breathing about. For me to live. Not, not, not the death part, but for me. For me to live is Christ. And when it comes my turn to die, it will be gain. But for me to live is Christ. 